What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 209. I'm the host, Kyle Anslone. Hope everyone had a great new year. This is the first episode of the show of 2022 and really excited uh, for everything I got coming up on today's show, talking about the Mideast Wars, Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, but also everything I have coming up for this week. Uh, the great Scott Horton's going to return to the show, uh, Connor Freeman, other guests and shows lined up. So be sure you're subscribed to the show. You won't want to miss what I have planned for this week. Also, a big announcement coming up this week on the show. So, uh, wherever you'd like to listen to the show, uh, if you want video version, YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, anywhere you could listen to podcast is hosted with the Libertarian Institute, which means you could subscribe to it through the Libertarian Institute all podcast feed. And yeah, anywhere you could listen to shows, just be sure to subscribe because I don't want people to miss what I got coming up here. Uh, if you want to donate to the show, all the information's in the show notes page. There's a Patreon and subscribe star crypto information is all right there and uh, we really appreciate when people could contribute you could also donate to the libertarian institute or uh, antiwar.com to support what i'm doing and then everybody just want to mention that the great sponsor of the show uh, been a great partnership with the show for well over a year i really love their products at paloma verde the url is paloma verde cbd.com the promo code is peace P-E-A-C-E, and that'll save you 70, uh, 25% off when you spend $75 or more, and it also gets the show a kit bat. So this is a fantastic deal uh, for you know you guys because you're getting a discount for the show because we're getting a kit back, and you're supporting a great libertarian-run small business. Uh, the lab test results are right there on their website at Paloma Verde. If you're new to CBD, check out the education uh, page they have. Everything you could want, the the soft gels, uh, Ed Strats, gummies, uh, even products for your dog. But my favorites are the topicals. So you're starting off the new year. Uh, you want to get better sleep. Try the products with melatonin. Uh, you're trying to work out more. I recommend the sports cream to make sure you're not feeling too much pain and you could keep getting out there and keep making it to the gym. Or if you just need a little pit me up, you're going to try to be more productive and stuff like that. Uh, fight off a little depression or anxiety. Uh, the gummies are absolutely fantastic for that. So tons of great products at Paloma Verde. Just be used to, sure to use the promo code PEACE when you check out. Help out the show. Help yourself out. Let's get the, into the episode. First thing I'm talking about on today's show is Afghanistan. And interesting article here from the New York Times uh, that details uh, some things going on with the Kabul uh, air, airport suicide bombing at the end of the U.S. withdrawal in August. And so it identifies, and I believe this person has actually been identified previously by the U.S. military, but Abdul Rahman al-Laragi as the uh, suicide bomber. This is claimed by the Islamic State, but now we're getting to some details into who Al Lagari is. He was an engineering student uh, and then was arrested in India. And this was in 2017 for planning a bombing in New Delhi. For an unclear reason, I'm not sure maybe he's originally from Afghanistan, uh, that wasn't I, I identified anywhere I could see in this article as to what nationality he actually is, but he ends up being transferred to two high-security U.S. prisons in Afghanistan, and then he was uh, transferred, I guess, when the U.S. was withdrawing from the, the prison be under U.S. control to them being under the Afghan government control. And, you know, whenever the Islamic State took over at the end of August, I guess around August 15th, uh, those prisons were largely emptied out. According to this report, when the Taliban took over, there's about 12,000 prisoners. They kill one of the leaders of the Islamic State Khorasan province that's in the prison and then release everybody else, which they say are 6,000 Taliban and 1,800 ISIS KP fighters. Uh, not sure exactly how accurate those numbers are or if I've looked for like maybe a Taliban statement because there wasn't one in this article 
to try to explain why they let those people out of the prison, uh, including the Taliban fighters, because even as this article notes that they're releasing people who are a threat to the Taliban, the ISKP is, you know, a bigger threat to the Taliban than anybody else, maybe other than the Pakistani government, maybe the only other, you know, group that really feels an immediate threat from uh, the, the Islamic State Khorasan province. So interesting uh, how, you know, he ends up in Afghanistan and then ends up being released here. Uh, but they say it's unclear of how this guy actually got teamed up with ISKP and ended up being the man that carried out this strike or this uh, suicide bombing. Uh, but that's what happened. A couple other notes from this article. They say he had a 25 pound bomb on him or it was a 25 pound bomb. So I think this adds to uh, the suspicion that myself and others have raised about exactly how nearly 200 people end up dead after this suicide bombing. Now, I've talked about how there's a possibility that it, it may not have been a large number of either U.S. soldiers or U.S. allies, uh, particularly uh, the 0102 groups from Afghanistan, the CIA trained commandos uh, that are now reported and confirmed to have been stationed at the types of posts like around and in the Abbey Gate of the Kabul airport where, where there was reported to be fire coming from. And so it, it seems likely that not everyone who died uh, died either from the suicide bomber or from the effects of that, you know, crowd surges, uh, people the this was happened in a sewage ditch. And so I think there's a possibility. I've even seen some reporting that a few people may have drowned in that sewage ditch. Uh, but it, it does raise some questions with the size of this bomb. Now, you, you know, the size of bomb could be a somewhat arbitrary thing depending on how it, it was developed, but there wasn't anything about this bomb that was uh, identified as being particularly effective or anything different than just some explosives being used. Uh, it's unclear, I, I guess, you know, how much shrapnel or something like that uh, was possibly used within this bomb. So, yeah, I, I think that's a... That's most of what's going on with the the actual terrorist attack that was uh, reported in, in this article. It does say that the United States is you know still trying to gather intelligence on the uh, you know people who worked with uh, the suicide bomber to get you know him to that position to get a bomb on him because this did only happen a few days after after he was released from the prison, and so you know I guess a couple things that you know really stick out in my mind are. First of all, does the U.S. really feel that they're they're competent after you know their attempted uh, drone strike after the the Kabul the suicide bombing at the Kabul airport here that was actually the drone strike in Kabul that kills ten people including seven civilians? Do we actually have the intelligence capabilities to identify the people associated with the suicide bomber and take them out in retribution without killing any civilians? And then also uh, a very obvious point that they apparently can't even get to or hypothesize in this article is the idea that the suicide bomber in the U.S. high security run prisons uh, ends up either, you know, getting more radicalized or there links up with the people that he eventually carries out this attack with. And and, uh, you know, this has obviously been seen in the past in Iraq uh, with like Camp Buka and, and, and uh, things like that, Abu Ghraib. And so uh, even al-Baghdadi, the, the leader of ISIS who was you know killed in recent years, uh, was in those prisons. And, and so I think it could be a situation like that. Um, you know, this article does mention something I haven't seen a lot of reporting in the mainstream media, that for the most part, the Islamic State Khorasan province, ISKP, is a is a break off of the Pakistani Taliban, uh, the Tariq E Taliban. And recently the Tariq E Taliban uh, declared an end to a ceasefire they had with the Pakistani government. So this is all happening on the Pakistan side of the border. Uh, but you have to wonder if maybe the release of you know, the, the ISIS members of these prisons has fueled uh, the Islamic State or the Trinky Taliban, uh, the associated group with the Islamic State Khorasan province in Pakistan, carrying out uh, some new attacks. They killed a 
Pakistani soldier who was w- working with, I believe, polio vaccination workers. I know the U.S. has been donating a lot of the Pfizer vaccines to uh, Pakistan, but I'm not sure if they're like distributing them along with the, the polio stuff at all. I think just this week they announced it was uh, another 5 million doses to Pakistan, bringing the total of 37 million. Uh, but along with the attack that targeted the uh, vaccination security guard, uh, there have also been attacks by the Trinky Taliban. Uh, one was a suicide attack, and then there was was a raid by the Pakistani security forces on uh, a TET position and that uh, led to, I think, four Pakistani forces being killed and then them capturing one member of uh, the, the Trinky Taliban. So, the, you know, the, this fighting is going on in the region, uh, not just in Afghanistan, but it, it, I wonder if, you know, maybe there's going to be uh, some help for taking on like the Islamic State Khorasan province by the Pakistani government or something like that, seeing that helping them uh, in, in their fight against the, the their own Taliban. All right, so let's move on and talk about a couple more things dealing with Afghanistan. There's growing pressure within, you know, the U.S. government and everything, uh, and also, you know, former U.S. government officials, military commanders, to do something about the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, last week, Three former military commanders in Afghanistan and four former U.S. ambassadors to Kabul, along with former senior officials, called on the administration to consider relaxing policies that froze the Afghan government's foreign assets and cuts off U.S. financial assistance, along with donor funding once accounting for three quarters of the nation's revenue. And so, you know, this isn't like a proposal that necessarily I I think they have. They're basically just saying like, look, this humanitarian crisis is getting so bad. Absolutely. You know, now we have to do something about it. And importantly, this isn't just human rights activists. Again, it's, you know, former military, uh, U.S. government diplomats. These aren't, you know, people who necessarily don't, you know, approve of sanctions. You know, they're, they're fine with them on Iran or things like that, but they understand that these sanctions are going to be counterproductive in just how massive uh, the humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan is about to be the, this, you know, winter that we're already in. Uh, there's been an announcement since then. This was on December 22nd. The authorized the U.S. authorized certain transactions with the Taliban, but it's kind of unclear if this is going to have any effect. And it's even laid out that way in the Reuters article. Uh, the United States formally exempted exempted U.S. and U.N. officials doing business with the Taliban from U.S. sanctions. And I mean, this is absurd, right? That you're going to uh, sanction a UN official for meeting with the Taliban and, you know, having some kind of agreements with the Taliban. This isn't, you know, talking about like major aid programs or anything like that. It's just the officials being able to go meet with the Taliban and, you know, do that kind of uh, level of business with the Taliban. Um, Unfortunately, you know, we're only talking about really small pots of aid and what would need to happen is either for uh, the U.S. to allow a large amount of aid into Afghanistan or for the U.S. to unfreeze the Afghan government accounts and allow the Taliban to have access to that money. Either way, if this is a large scale aid program, like anywhere you carry out large scale aid programs, People who, you know, have the monopoly of uh, violence, right? They have, the, they're the controlling government, the militants, whatever they are. They're going to steal some of it, right? That That's just a part of it. And, you know, taxes apply and everything like that, even if it's aid. And so I, I'm sure that if the U.S. does allow this money, it, it may be somewhat of a political loser because the Republicans are going to cry and scream that, oh, my God, some of this money is going to the Taliban and the Taliban once killed Americans, even though we killed far more, you know, Taliban and everything like that. And unfortunately, the U.S. mainstream media is really covering up what's happening in Afghanistan. This laid out by the great Jim Loeb at Responsible Statecraft, looking into the amount of coverage given uh, by ABC, NBC and CBS, which are, you know, the most watched news programs in the United States. These are the, you know mainstream not the cable news uh, networks and they've devoted only 21 minutes combined of the three networks combined 
on Afghanistan since the end of September. Uh, of course, before that, it was all uh, Afghanistan 24-7, uh, 20, 427 minutes of coverage uh, in the two months before that. And it, you know, just goes to show when they could, uh, you know, make the Taliban out to be really bad and this being some kind of crisis and everything like that. Boy, they'll have all the reporters and everything. But when the U.S. is just starving children to death, uh, that, you know, there's really nothing sensational and exciting about that as far as the news goes and so they don't even bother to cover it whatsoever even more disturbing it's not like of those 21 minutes is largely coverage of the humanitarian crisis i think it's about 10 segments total and only two of them are actually dedicated to the humanitarian crisis um he says, moreover, 15 of the 21 minutes devoted to Afghanistan between October 1st and December 25th had nothing to do with the increasingly desperate humanitarian crisis that threatens 23 million people, more than half the country's population, with extreme levels of hunger, as many as 1 million children with uh, death due to severe acute malnutrition this winter. And so, again, uh, you know, the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan is going to be massive. I, I am hesitant around that 1 million number for children just because I don't want to sound alarmist. Now, it, maybe it could be that bad, but I, I feel like these humanitarian groups tend to overestimate what that number is going to be. Uh, but, you know, even if they're over overestimating by a factor of 10, I mean, we're still talking about 100,000 Afghan children that are going to starve to death this winter. But not only that, you, you know, one of the things that's really missed about this is, let, let's say they that one of the reasons I'm hesitant to always use the 1 million number two is because what if it doesn't hit that number and let's say only 10,000 children starve to death, you know, th this uh, winter in Afghanistan, which is absolutely horrific. But if you said 1 million and then it's only 10,000 people think that it's not as serious then. And then in the other part of this too, is that even if those other uh, 990,000 children who didn't starve to death, uh, you know, live through the winter and everything like that, when you're talking about that serious level of acute uh, malnutrition for all those kids, even if they do survive, these are going to have lifelong impacts on their health and on their mental health and on the Afghan society and culture. I mean, you know, a Afghanistan, the, the U.S. past four decades, but, it, you know, particularly the past two decades of war in Afghanistan are going to be a, a scar on that society that will be remembered into eternity, right? Even if you're talking about, uh, again, you know, if you starve a million Afghan children to death, that, that will be something that will always be remembered in Afghanistan as one of the darkest things to ever happen uh, to those people. I mean, sure that, you know, the Soviets killed a, a million people or so during their uh, years long war, but a lot of those people are adults and everything like that to starve, uh, you know, a huge portion of like the, the coming Afghan uh, generation to death is huge. But, you know, now you're talking about also, that all these children suffering this secure uh, malnutrition, all these health problems that they're going to have, all the, the mental health problems that they're going to develop, you know, there there is pretty resounding research in the U.S. on how important it is, you know, for children to have the uh, pro appropriate amount of, like, food and nutrients and everything, and, you know... Maybe it doesn't sound so serious as somebody's, you know, just shorter or stunted in certain ways, but you're also talking about increased risk, especially with all the PTSD that's been, uh, you, you know, suffered by the children of Afghanistan over the past 20 years from the U.S. war. You know, with that and the malnutrition, you're talking about, I'm sure, so many more increases, uh, examples of uh, drug use and drug addiction. And so how many of these children, yeah, they're not going to starve to death this winter, but because of how their brain develops due to this malnutrition and due uh, to the U.S. warfare over the past 20 years are going to end up overdosing on an opiate, you know, before they're the, the age of 20 or something like that, or going to develop more serious mental health problems that could cause them to act violently and, uh, you know, just an increase in people who act violently whenever you have an increase of people who uh, experience severe acute malnutrition. You know, malnourished children are more likely uh, to 
engage in certain crimes and things like that. So, you know, none of this should be surprising that we're, you know, inflicting a multi-general generation long problem in Afghanistan that's going to take forever to work out of that society. And, you know, same with the other two countries or three countries I'm talking about today, Iraq, Syria and Yemen. A uh, few stories on refugees trying to make it from Afghanistan, or not refugees, I guess, but Afghans trying to get to the United States. Uh, there's 60,000 people in Afghanistan who have applied to come to the United States. I believe that includes like interpreters and their families. So it's not 60,000 interpreters and, you know, then there are 60,000 wives and their 180,000 children or whatever, but this will be 60,000 people total. And according to the State Department, about 33,000 of those Afghans have passed their initial uh, uh, what they called more onerous vetting requirements and are eligible for evacuation of Afghanistan. Of those people, I believe it is uh, 2.2 thousand who have already gotten out of Afghanistan. And then there are, let's see. Um, uh, I guess another potential like 2,000 or more uh, beyond that 60,000. So a, a total of 62,000 are believed to, you know, be people who worked for the U.S. government and remain in Afghanistan. By the way, I, I, it's a little confusing how they write it because they say, um, you know, in this uh, Afghan interpreters and other Afghans, it, it's not clear if, the, you know, this is just interpreters, just interpreters or other Afghans who worked with the U.S., uh, interpreters or other Afghans, meaning essentially anyone in Afghanistan, or just like the interpreters and their families. So, uh, you know, questions on how these numbers are coming out and everything like that, but uh, it, it seems like tens of thousands of more Afghans will likely be coming to the U.S. Now, that's through a um, one program. There's another program that people are, Afghans are trying to use. Uh, 35,000 in total have applied to come to the United States through the humanitarian Humanitarian parole program. And I guess one issue this program is having is typically it only processes about 2000 applications a year. And, you know, this year they have multiple times that number. Uh, so far, they've denied 740 applications and conditionally approved about 140. Typically, this program only improves about 500. So uh, if you look at those numbers, if it gets you know, approves 25%. Normally that's about where it is with the Afghans. Uh, so I, I guess maybe we could expect that to continue. And, you know, most of the people who are applying through that program uh, won't make it to the United States. It's now reported that the U.S. carried out 153, 156 airstrikes in Afghanistan uh, in the month of August. That's you know the last month that the U.S. was in and bombing Afghanistan. At least as of now, you know the Biden administration says we have these over uh, the horizon capabilities, but currently is engaging in drone strikes in Afghanistan. At least as far as been reported anywhere, I haven't even heard the Taliban complain that the U.S. is carrying out drone strikes. In Afghanistan. And in fact, it's been since like the end of September that the Taliban even complained that U.S. drones were flying over Afghanistan, although that could still be happening or the U.S. could be using some kind of other intelligence gathering methods uh, for, you know, figuring out what's happening there, although they're probably not doing a very good job anyways. Um, but this was an uptick in airstrikes and was the highest number uh, at August 2021 since October of 2020. Now, uh, you know, I did talk about on the show, and I do think it's the case that I kind of surprised that the U.S. actually didn't carry out more airstrikes in August and really try to pummel the Taliban to at least slow their advance and everything like that, but maybe reading the writing on the wall or whatever, or the airstrikes just being ineffective uh, led that number to be 150. Interesting op-ed uh, from the Washington Post, who won Afghanistan? Private contractors. There's nothing in this article that anybody in this uh listens to the show is going to be surprised about. Uh, but the one thing that I thought was, you know, worth noting is that this is running in the wall street journal and, uh, you know, an article basically saying that, yeah, the contractors are the only people from a uh, benefit from the Afghan war and they got filthy rich on it. 
Last story on Afghanistan, this from Business Insider. After taking in Afghan commandos, the UK military may try to build another elite special operations force. And so they, they want to use the Afghan commandos. I'm guessing these are the guys that were like trained by the uh, either US, UK special forces, or maybe even uh, the, the US CIA. Afghan commandos were known to carry out war crimes in Afghanistan, concerning that the UK is looking to incorporate them in their military. But if the UK is thinking about doing it, uh, I suspect the US is uh, thinking about that possibility as well. And, um, you know, th this could be very concerning if the U.S. is using these former commandos to, you know, go around the world and carry out war crimes or something like that. All right, let's talk about Afghanistan. Or, excuse me, Iraq now. Uh, just finished up about uh, Afghanistan. So, moving on to Iraq. 5% uh, of the world's orphans are in Iraq. Uh, according to the Iraqi High Commission for Human Rights, Five million orphans uh, live in Iraq and are, you know, subject to some pretty serious poverty conditions. Uh, according to the report, one million children are working as laborers to support their families, including 45,000 who don't have official identification documents as a result of their parents' affiliation with the Islamic State group. Around 4.5 million children are in families living below the poverty line, with 25% of the total population of Iraq living in poverty and unemployment rate of 14%, the commission found. The number of missing citizens since 2014, the year the Islamic State group launched its offensive in the country, has reached 8,000. The commission said Iraqi authorities have failed to fulfill their duty to those missing to investigate the whereabouts uh, to compensate their fan, fi families financially. Uh, but I really just like, man, that hit me when I read that there's 5 million orphans in Iraq. And how many of those are orphans because of the U.S. war in that country? And, you know, of course, you could look at this through just the U.S. bombing campaigns and how many people did the U.S. directly kill? Uh, how many people are how many children lost their parents uh, by the civil war that the U.S. started in Iraq or the civil war that the U.S. started in Syria that blew back into Iraq? And then, uh, you know, how many children lost parents? through uh, the U.S. bad Shia militias in Iraq and, and all these kinds of uh, war crimes that were committed. And, of course, now you do have, uh, you know, children who were born in Iraq during the years, uh, you know, one, two, I guess, maybe two and a half, three years in some places, that the Islamic State held territory. And so, you know, if, if you are a baby born to ISIS parents and then your parents are killed or captured, you certainly don't have any identification, no birth certificate or anything like that and so it's going again th these are generational problems that the u.s has created in in these countries and uh if we look at iraq right now uh margaret griffith at antiwar.com does a great job of writing up these iraq daily reports where she just you know goes through and sees who's being killed in iraq by who and so you know, I'm not going to break down all of these because there's so many different operations going on. But you have the uh, Iraqi Kurds, the, the Peshmerga, carrying out operations against the Islamic State. The Islamic State carrying out terrorist attacks in Iraqi Kurdistan. But then also you have uh, either Turkish or Syrian Kurds, uh, a part of the PKK. Uh, that's, you know, the the. Turkish uh, Kurdish group uh, that, you know, operate in the Iraqi mountains of uh, northern Iraq. And so Turkey is bombing them and they're also carrying out attacks against Turkish soldiers. Uh, you have various militants who it's not exactly clear who they are doing things like uh, firing rockets near the U.S. Embassy. This happened on December 19th. I believe two of those uh, two rockets were fired. One was intercepted and one missed the embassy. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And then you have the Shia militias. You recently had an assassination attempt against the Iraqi 
uh, prime minister. Of course, you had elections there. They're in dispute. And I'll talk about that in a second. But just, you know, think about all the different groups in Iraq that are fighting against each other and just how complicated this is all going to be uh, to work out in the coming years. Again, you know, you have major Turkish military operations in Iraq, you know, killing going on every day. Uh, you know, they're, they're now targeting Yazidis that they say are allied with the PKK in northern Iraq. Um, the the Peshmerga reported 350 plus people were killed by the Islamic State in, I'm not sure if it in Iraq total or just in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. I would kind of guess it will only have the information for Iraqi Kurdistan, but maybe, you know, they uh, accumulate through public reports or something like that. Or, you know, this is a part of the Iraqi government that's, you know, controlled by the Peshmerga or, you know, offices with Peshmerga officials, something like that. Uh, but, you know, important that just all this fighting and conflict uh, to continues to go on in Iraq 20 years almost now after the U.S. overthrew that government and, you know, pretended to create a nation. And uh, we, we just created so much violence and that has left so many children parentless. And uh, that's going to put them in horrible positions and give them horrible opportunities in life. And, you know, while I'm not saying that all these kids are going to turn out and be bad people or anything like that, but if you look at statistics, how things work, uh, what happens when kids are abused and parentless and uh, malnourished and, and all these kinds of things, you know, they're more likely to engage in crime, violent acts, develop serious mental illnesses, develop health problems that uh, addiction issues, all these kinds of things. Uh, again, they're going to create cycles of violence in Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, let's move on. Talk about Syria now for years to come. So recently, I was on the Fortress on a Hill podcast uh, that uh, I've talked about in the past on the show. It's, it's an absolutely great podcast. I recommend people subscribe. It's co-hosted by Danny Shurgeon, who's been on the show in the past. Uh, Henry and Keegan also. Th this particular show was just me and Henry. And we talked about the New York Times reporting on the Talon Amble Stripe Force in Syria and how many uh, civilians were wrapped up in, in those killings. So if you want to hear you know, me talk about that, I recommend that show. Uh, but then the New York Times put out another article titled Hidden Pentagon Records Revealed the Patterns of Failure in Deadly Airstrikes. And they got, you know, 3,000 plus uh, or not, I think 1,000 plus of about 3,000 records uh, that they're looking for. And they say this is part one of a two part series on just how the U.S. killed so many people and then, you know, ignored it or covered it up uh, during the anti-ISIS campaign, mainly in Syria, but also in Iraq. And so, you know, just remember this is New York Times reporting. So some of it, I do think they take it way too easy on the Pentagon, but at other times uh, they do a pretty good job of holding the Pentagon to account. So I picked out, this is a really long article I could talk, you know, about for like three hours probably, <laughs> but I just picked out a few of the, I thought, high, not really highlights, but a few of the things in this article that are really important. Uh, but one of the first things I, I want to mention is that the most important thing about this article is that it's being reported in the New York Times. And, uh, it, you know, if you listen to this show, the Scott Horton show, or, you know, any independent media or, you know, read antiwar.com, consortium news, things. Things like that. Uh, Air Wars, a great group on this, will not be surprised by anything and, you know, could think of examples in the show of how I talked about in the past that, you know, this was either happening or likely going on. So they talk about the problem with identifying, you know, just like warning signs like men on motorbikes uh, in Afghanistan, in the Helmand province, you have people using like handheld radios. These are things that uh, arbitrarily kind of, I mean, not uh, necessarily, but kind of, you know, they say these are things that terrorists generally do. And so if we see people doing this, we're going to assume they're terrorists, even if we don't see them having weapons or anything like that and carry out an attack. And so one of the things in Syria was men on motorbikes. And so they see men on motorbikes in formation. That's an excuse to carry out drone strike. Good enough. Go ahead. They're doing it. Um, they say that in some cases, they, they were able to review the videos, read the report statements, and they said that if you look at the video, 
you could actually see that children are present or civilians are present in the video, but then they carry out the strike anyways. And there, there's no reporting on it after within like, you know, their reports that the civilians were there and present. And, and so it, it seems like a lot of it, they just completely ignore what's happening. Um, there, there's this story uh, report uh, from Missoula where the U.S. decided that the commanders were deciding, you know, they, they had a payload on a plane, right? And so they have, I, I don't know what, but let's say like a 500-pound a bomb, a couple 2,000-pound pound, pound bombs, like uh, one really precision 500-pound uh, bombs, and then almost like a dumb bomb. Uh, maybe it's guided, but with a less sophisticated guided system. And so you're the guy flying the plane, right? And not every time you fire your one most advanced bomb do you go back and you know, reload the plane. And so if you fire your most advanced bomb, then the next time you, you don't have that as a, a potential option. And so seeing that, they decided to use a less uh, precision bomb, use uh, a, either a less precision one or, or a larger bomb and ended up killing three civilians. And so, you know, it just goes to show that the, these are the decisions that the military is making. They're okay with it, right? And even though they say, oh, yeah, we have these nice new fancy smart bombs that are going to prevent us from killing civilians, it turns out that they don't use those smart bombs all the time. They just have them on the plane uh, and then they kill civilians and they don't care anyways. Um, they say the New York Times says that at times there's only seconds of footage. Uh, the New York Times kind of assumes that this is all they actually had and this, this is what they went off of and assumed. I kind of wonder maybe if the New York Times or even the Pentagon, you know, through editing by uh, people at whatever level are actually changing what the New York Times is seeing versus what the military actually had. So I would be suspect of that. But, it, you know, if they are just going off a seconds of footage, that's extremely disturbing and problematic uh, as well. Let's see. They, you know, they point out in this article that nobody is going to be held responsible for this, that uh, there's like one case where somebody got like a slap on the wrist. But other than that, in a general sense, nobody has been punished whatsoever uh, for any of this. Let's see. There is... A, they say institutional acceptance of civilian casualties. Again, anybody who's listened to the show knows that's the case, but that's written in the New York Times is somewhat uh, significant. Uh, one of the things that is, you know, unique about this article, what the New York Times is able to do, where, you know, I just have to go on reports from the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights and what local media is reporting. And, you know, maybe the intercept gets on the ground, maybe, uh, you know, other like Reuters has a, a story on the ground or something like that. But the New York Times has the money and the lawyers to sit in court and fight with the Pentagon for years to get these documents. They even get all the documents from the Pentagon in here. It lays out that they're fighting over more documents from this war, from the Afghan war, and the Pentagon doesn't want to give them up. So unless you have millions of dollars, you literally can't do this journalism. And so, you know, that's why I did want to take the time to talk about this article and, and you know, why there are important things in here. And it's because the New York Times has the ability to do this and occasionally will. Although, you know, I guess if I had the resources of the New York Times, I would be challenging and trying to get this stuff far more often than they are. Um, because one of the things you get that you, you know, even if you know 30 civilians died in a certain attack or something like that, and the Pentagon tr covered it up, unless they, um, you know, unless you actually are able to get the records like the New York Times is, you don't get the conversation between uh, the commanders and the people in the plane and the drone operators and everything like that. And so you learn like some of the words that they use to change what's happening here. So, you know, you have, let's say they carry out an airstrike and people are fleeing from the building. They call those squatters, you know, not civilians running for their life, but squatters, which sounds funny. And I'm sure that most uh, men in the military get the kind of sexual joke behind that. Right. And just really disturbing uh, that, that, you know, they're, they're using this kind of language to, 
uh, talk about kills, killing civilians and, and blowing people up, dismembering them with multiple, uh, you know, hundred pound, thousands of pounds explosives, uh, and so many children dying. But when you're, you know, using words like squirters and stuff like that, and they talk, I think about what are the slashes and everything that, you know, th- this kind of, uh, new speak kind of, uh, 1984 stuff really, I, I think, helps to allow the average soldier to be involved in these war crimes and not be uh, disgusted by what they're doing in the moment and, and try to put a stop to it. It identified uh, the, the article identified a few things that led to civilian casualties. Uh, the first was misidentifying civilians. And so, you know, this would be looking at a thing, seeing a guy with a cane and thinking it's a gun or something like that. No, that happens all the time, uh, and I'm sure that at times it's because of poor quality footage, but also, you know, you see what you want to see, and if you want to see a gun, you're going to see a gun, and I'm sure a lot of it's, you know, just projection and also covering it up, right? Like, if you want to bomb these people and that guy has a stick, something long in his hand, if you really want to carry out the strike and you think carrying out that strike is important, then it's very easy to misidentify civilians as militants. Uh, they also say that flawed intelligence is a problem. And of course, you know, taught so much on the show about like the Kabul airstrike and things like that. Uh, of course that happens all the time. Uh, one of the problems they say is poor video quality kind of already mentioned that, uh, and also mentioned that in the strike, uh, that the New York times report on Syria a couple of months ago, where 60 plus civilians were killed, uh, talking about how they, they didn't realize that there was higher quality drone footage of it. And they used lower quality drone footage to make that decision. Then they, they talk about this problem, uh, these kind of two things that happen that they claim that the military uses to claim in the New York Times, I, I feel like kind of goes along with it, but they don't just eat it up, but they kind of repeat it. Uh, reasons for civilians killed, and those are civilians walking into the frame or driving into the frame. And so, right, you imagine this thing, like where the drone camera is following this car down a dirt road, right? And then the drone operator hits the button, and as soon as they hit the button, some uh, a car traveling the other direction comes into the frame, and just as the missile is striking the car, the other car is passing and kills five civilians, three children, along with the militants that they're targeting. And they pretend like shrug, nothing we could do about this. And it's like, really, you can zoom out the camera a little bit or develop more or different cameras. You know, this went on for years. This is between 2014 and 2018. This reporting is going on. It's not, you know, between March and, and May where, yeah, maybe, you know, this happens a few times and then they figure out they develop a, a wider lens camera and they put it on there. You, you know, you would think that there would be a relatively simple calculation that you could do to figure out like, you know, if a car is traveling at 60 miles an hour, how far zoomed out do you have to be to ensure that the, the missile you fire at, at that car isn't going to hit something else coming into the frame? Uh, th- that that seems like that should be an absolutely possible calculation to carry out and, and then to, like, have some kind of formula to, to prevent this from happening. But they have no interest in developing that technology because they have no interest in not killing civilians because the lives of Syrian, Iraqis, Afghans, or Yemenis just mean absolutely nothing to the people at the Pentagon. And the last thing, and we talked about this a lot on the show, Will Porter has done a lot of really good work on this uh, propaganda line. The second secondary explosion oh it wasn't our bomb that killed the civilians our bomb just killed the terrorists because we have you know magical precision bombs but when you know it when we hit the car it also blew up the the gas in the car and that killed the three children and it wasn't our bomb that actually you know that this stupid stuff that they come up with if you set off a bomb and then a propane tank explodes you're responsible for it that's that's the way it works 
All right, so moving on from this, talking about some uh, things going on in Syria now, of course, this is from a few years ago. The U.S. isn't waging like a major air war in Syria at this time, but that doesn't mean the U.S. occupation of Syria isn't ongoing, and the occupation is carried out by uh, the U.S.-bad Syrian Democratic Forces. These are the mainly uh, Kurdish forces, although, you know, they could script Arabs as well to enforce them to fight in their, their war and to enforce their occupation over over eastern Syria, but we just had uh, this from Dave DeCamp on December 13th at antiwar.com. Uh, the U.S. bad Syrian Kurdish led SDF carried out a raid in eastern Syria's Deir al Azor province on Monday. With the backing of the U.S. led coalition, the SDF took out five ISIS fighters, but reports from Syrian state media and the UK based War Monitor, uh, that's the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, suggests that uh, civilians were killed in the raid. Syrian state media report that the U.S. warplanes conducted a large-scale airdrop with SDF in the town of uh, Al-Barizia, and that the airdrop was accompanied by indiscriminate fire that killed three civilians who were all members of the same family. Isn't a surprise the SDF... uh, you know, is conscripting young women in uh, Syria and, you know, have been known to uh, be pretty brutal, particularly, I think, towards the the Syrian Arab population and uh, Yazidis as well. We also have uh, this Al Hall, and whether you call it a refugee camp or a refugee prison or an ISIS prison, is run by the Syrian Kurds uh, in northeastern Syria. There's like 10,000 people, and for years I've been talking about this prison camp and the horrible things going on in there. There's mass reports that uh, in large sections of the camp, you've actually had like children that have lived there for four, five, six plus years now, so they've essentially grown up in there Uh, a lot of the services are provided by uh, the you know women who live in the camp and some of who are the husbands of ISIS fighters and you know believe in that that ideology and I think some of the prominent women in the camp um, are you know former members of the high-ranking ISIS fighters and so you know there's some pretty nasty things going on 83 six people have died in that camp this year including 63 Iraqis in the past month six have died uh, three Iraqis two men one women Two Syrians have also died, one man, one one man, one woman, and then one identified person was also killed. Um it's good. Yeah, these aren't deaths. These are murders that we're talking about. And so uh, some of the murders are blamed on the Islamic State. I- I'm not sure exactly how the Islamic State is able to carry out murders in these prisons, but uh, really, really problematic situation going on there. And I'm, I'm sure it's somewhat like the high security prisons in Afghanistan or uh, Abu Ghraib, Kambuka in Iraq. Uh, this, you know, could be the, the next generation of of, uh, you know, anti-American, you know, or just, you know, militants, brutal militants to come out of the Middle East could come out of this camp where, again, you have essentially a large population of children, young men who are, you know, being raised in squalor conditions. And I'm sure, you know, very hateful of the United States for, for the position that they're put in. This from Jason Ditz at Antiwar.com. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, uh, 2020 was one of the, or 2021, excuse me, was one of the most mild years of the Syrian civil war so far, with 3,746 deaths. Uh, that included 1,500 civilians and 360 children. And yeah, I mean, this isn't kind of a surprise. Largely, the, the Syrian war has been on a simmer for the past few years. And, uh, you know, the, the number of dead continued to drop, particularly since uh, the, the ISIS state, uh, the Islamic State lost all their territory. Now, the Islamic State is still able to mount attacks in Syria. They uh, occasionally attack, like, Syrian government forces. Also, often in, like, the uh, around the Euphrates River, which, you know, maybe suggest that they're coming from the U.S. occupied territory of of Syria. Uh, But Turkey is also carrying out operations in in northern Syria. You have the Islamic, um, I guess not Islamic State, uh, the 
a Al Qaeda affiliate, Al Nusra, uh, Haria Tariya Al Sham, HTS, whatever they want to call themselves now, uh, the you know jihadists that exist in the Idlib province of Syria that are backed by Turkey, there is fighting on and off. It, it doesn't seem very consistent. It's never as uh, high as tensions as it was during. Uh, but like a few years ago when this, uh, you know, bombing was going on and everything. Uh, but there has been some fight between the Syrian government and the Islamists in uh, Syria. But, you know, a lot of the chaos and death going on in Syria, nobody talks about it, is that be the behest of the Israelis who carry out scores of airstrikes every year in Syria. And they say in 2022 they have no plans to slow that down or stop. But recent uh, targets of the Israeli government include the Damascus airport, and damage the runways as well as a key Syrian port of Lakata. And so, you know, the, these seem to be pretty serious escalations to me, uh, targeting more civilian infrastructure like airports and ports by the Syria, uh, by the Israelis in Syria. Of course, very little discussion, if any ever, in the United States about what the what Israel, you know, a key US ally is doing in Syria. Last story on Syria. The U.S. report to draw down a drone uh, from Syria that it believes was launched by uh, I Iranian allied Syrian militants, whoever that is, just any Shia in Syria, I suppose, uh, that was headed towards the U.S. base in Al Tanaf, Syria. So the U.S. occupies Syria east of the Euphrates River, minus the territory uh, that Turkey controls along its border. But then uh, the U.S. also controls the base in a 50 kilometer or so zone around it uh, on the Syrian Jordanian border at the border and crossing of Al Tanaf. Uh, in the past, the U.S. has backed like up to, uh, I think, 1,500 Syrian rebels there. I have no clue if there are any Syrian rebels left there or if this is at this point just U.S. soldiers and maybe U.K. allied soldiers uh, at that base. But nonetheless, the U.S. occupies it. And anytime anybody gets within, about, again, about 50, 55 kilometers of it, uh, they start dropping bombs are uh, and then in this case a drone was fired at it i was kind of surprised that more hasn't been made of this story because they're claiming it's from an iranian bat group uh this could be just propaganda from you know the u.s israel side trying to undermine talks with iran trying to just have another reason to demonize iran at the same time there's plenty of reasons why the syrians would be interested in testing you know if the americans are serious about continuing to hold that position because you know this is syrian territory that i assume the government would want to take back at some time also, there are militant groups in Syria that I'm sure, you know, are, are militias allied with Iran and maybe supported by Iran, maybe not taking direct orders from Iran, uh, but at the same time, uh, I would just guess that there's a, a real risk here that, uh, you, you know, that this isn't a direct tie to Iran or anything like from the orders of Iran, but it is an Iranian tied group that carried this out just because, you know, they, they don't like what America is doing throughout the Middle East and see themselves as uh, something as the axis of resistance. One last thing on this, I, I guess I'll mention, is in Iraq, it's been pretty widely reported, and I don't think disputed even in the U.S. mainstream media, that since the U.S. assassinated uh, Qasem Soleimani two years ago, the Iranians have lost their ability to some extent to control what the Iraqi Shia militias are doing. And so... Uh, with that, I wonder if that's also true in Syria or not. Uh, you know, with the death of the Soleimani, they they have less of that ability. I haven't seen that reporting in Syria, but I kind of suspect it, it would at least to some extent be the case. Although, along with the assassination of uh, Soleimani was al Mohandas, who was the leader of the Iraqi Popular Mobilization Forces. And so it, it's possible maybe without that loss uh, equivalent in Syria, Iran didn't maintain more control of the forces there or something like that. All right, uh, let's see. Talk about Yemen. A few stories here. Important stuff. Uh, the Houthis say that the airport has been temporarily reopened after it was damaged by a Saudi airstrike. Uh, what happened was is the Saudis claim that 
the Houthis were launching drones or missiles from the the, uh, airport in the capital of Sana'a. Not sure if that was actually the case. That's what the Saudis claimed. So they bombed the airport. That did damage to the communications equipment. And so the Houthis are reporting that the damage to the communications equipment is causing some unsafe situations at the Sana'a airport. Don't know if that's true. That's what the Houthis are saying. The uh, UN, though, is urging the internationally recognized government of Yemen, which isn't the Houthis, even though they've held the capital city for five plus years. It is the government recognized by Saudi Arabia, whose mandate elapsed in 2004 and hasn't even been able to exist in Yemen for years now, but that the government is controlled uh, by Mansour Hadi, who lives in uh, in Saudi Arabia. And so that's the government that the UN is appealing to, to allow the new communications equipment to be imported, and that this would help to allow more aid flights into Sana'a. But the, the Saudi goal in Yemen is not to allow aid into the country. It's in fact to do the exact opposite and cause as much pain to the civilian population as possible. And I as, assume that's why uh, that communications equipment has not been able to enter Yemen yet. But it really needs to get in there because anything that's going to help humanitarian flights is an absolute must. Now, there may be some concern on the Saudi side and maybe some of it legitimate that if they give this communications equipment to the Houthis, they would be able to salvage stuff out of the other equipment or, you know, rig this new equipment up in some way uh, to be able to either use it as a dual purpose or. Or, you know, just use it as a military technology as well. At the same time, I think there's just an obligation. You got this is an international airport, it's the Sanaa airport. It's the only way to get a lot of things in and out of the country, um, especially with uh, the essential Saudi blockade of the the Hadeda port and most of Yemen in general with the extreme uh, inspections regime that they they put on uh, plane or not planes, uh, ships trying to get into the country that. Um, you got to allow this in because it's absolutely necessary lifeline. Uh, right now we have the, uh, UN envoy to Yemen. That's Hans Grudenberg expressing concern about the ongoing escalation of the war in Yemen, saying it's amongst the worst, uh, seen in many years and warning that it's increasingly putting civilians at risk. So, you know, recently I read of fighting and uh, Saudi airstrikes around the city of Taiz. Of course, uh, the capital city of Sana'a has been bombed by uh, Saudi Arabia quite a bit. There's been some fighting around the key port city of Hadeda, but most of the fighting has been going on in the Mareb province, which is, I guess, by Yemeni standards at least, has some oil, and so there's some wealth there. Uh, I'm not sure how developed it is or how useful it would actually be if the Houthis were able to take it uh, to turn that oil into any kind of profit whatsoever but there's been fighting for that city in central yemen also probably holds some uh significance in yemen as it is one of the few cities uh that was initially uh a part of north yemen when before yemen was unified in the 1990s uh and so maybe taking that by the houthis would give them an opportunity to kind of have a, a northern yemen state that once existed At the same time, there's now fighting breaking out in the province uh, south of Mareb. So if you look at Yemen on a map, you got like central Yemen is Mareb. And then south of that, uh, going down to the Gulf of Aden, is the Shabwa province. And previously, the the head of that province, uh, through the internationally recognized government, was somebody who supported the Saudi-backed government. But now that person has been replaced and supports a more UAE-backed solution, I guess, in Yemen. And that would be the Southern Transitional Council. And in response to this move, the Emiratis actually moved some forces out of Hadeda and over to the, the Shabwa uh, province. So this is, you know, interesting things going on in Yemen, not only between uh, the Houthis and the Saudi-backed government, which is allied with the UAE, 
But in southern Yemen, where they're, they're not fighting against the Houthis, these two sides are often fighting against each other. Uh, so that's going on. But there's maybe reports that the Houthis are looking at exploiting this and have actually carried out a missile strike in the region and killed many, many soldiers. Also, Saudi Arabia carried out an airstrike in that area and killed 12 many soldiers that uh, at least reported by mistake, although... Maybe they were allied on the wrong side or something, and it wasn't such a mistake, but that that's the way it's being reported. And for all the all the purposes that we'll ever know on this show, that's that's probably what we'll have. But I'll, I'll keep my eye out. And uh, I, I do think fighting in that area of Yemen is looking to increase with the instability between the Saudi and UAE bad sides. Who knows who could be uh, looking to exploit that? The Houthis would be, you know, the top contenders. But you know, these are areas of Yemen where, you know, in recent years, even uh, AQAP, ISIS have held territory. So. A lot of potential chaos uh, to come in Yemen. Uh, but again, uh, main things on on Yemen I want to talk about was the communications equipment needs to get into the Sanaa airport to allow more flights in and out of there. Uh, aid flights, aid needs to get in because as the UN says, uh, the humanitarian situation, the fighting game there is worse and worse. People, children suffering and dying. Uh, the numbers continue to go up. And while they admit it's you know, well over a quarter million now, my guess is that number is much, much higher actually. And, uh, you know, this is all blood on the hands of the American empire. Uh, wouldn't happen without the American empire. And, um, you know, start way back in the Obama administration now. Trump continued it, uh, helped the Saudis continue to wage it. And despite Biden's pledge to turn Saudi Arabia into a pariah state, uh, uh, Biden has bent the knee to Mohammed bin Salman and allowed him to continue this genocidal campaign in Yemen. All right, everybody, that's where I'm wrapping it up today. Again, big week coming up on Conflicts of Interest. Big announcement this week. Scott Horton returns to the show. More interviews, more shows. Subscribe, share, support the show. Uh, thanks, everybody, so much for a great 2021. Looking forward to an even better 2022. And uh, see you all with more shows later this week.